bad boys. This is not the Will Smith bad boys. A very different bad boys. No, it's the Sean Penn bad boys. There's no car chases. Well, eh, two I can think of. Yeah, they're kind of low speed. Enough to kill a kid. Yeah, oh, that's that's true. Yes, yes. They're not exactly Fast and the Furious, but God damn it! I'm sorry, I'm off. What? I felt like I was off. I, you're definitely off. What's going on? Okay, let's 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 start this again. Remember when we first met John McClane? Argyle picked him up from the plane and took him down to Nakatomi Tower at the Christmas party. And the terrorists were overzealous, but it was sweet when they killed Ellis. And with a little help from Alan, John McClane kicked ass. Welcome back to Shat the Movies, the podcast where we answer the question were the movies we loved when we were growing up really that good? Have you ever caught yourself thinking, why don't they make movies like they used to? Can you still remember spending your Friday night searching for the perfect movie rental at Blockbuster Video? Do you know what Blockbuster Video is? If you answered yes, and this is the podcast for you, I am one of your hosts, Gene Lyons, and alongside me is my co-host, Big D, Dick Ebert. Good evening. And each week, we take a look back in time and decide if our favorite films still hold up. The movies we cover are chosen by you, the listeners, who generously commission the films you love. If you'd like to see all the movies we have covered, will cover, and want to choose one for yourself, please visit shatpod.com and have a look. At the end of each podcast, we'll provide you, the audience, with the number of wipes each movie takes to get off your respective butts. So thank you so much for listening. If you have not already, hit that subscribe button and share with a friend. It's how we help the podcast grow. Additionally, subscribe to our sister podcast, Shat on TV. We review TV series such as Westworld, Taboo, American Gods, Game of Thrones, True Detective, Lovecraft Country, and Watchmen. Find all information and past episodes at shatpod.com slash TV. And finally, if you'd like to hang out with us live, just go to YouTube and subscribe to Shat the Movies on YouTube, where we play video games, host watch parties, and edit this podcast live. All that being said, Big D, what movie are you reviewing tonight? Gene, tonight's film is very different than last week's lighthearted comedy about the police and the police academy. Uh, one of our great listeners and dear friend of the podcast, Scott H., wrote in and said, please commission the 1983 dark American coming-of-age crime film, Bad Boys. This is the Sean Penn Bad Boys, not the Martin Lawrence, Will Smith, uh, Michael Bay crash crime, that whole thing. Uh, and he was kind enough to send us in a voicemail to share his thoughts so we can hear why this film is important to him and and why we should take our time tonight to go to a very dark place. Hey, Shaq Crew, Scott H. from Friendswood, Texas. Thank you for accepting this commission of the 1983 Bad Boys film. I wanted y'all to do this one because in the Blood In, Blood Out podcast, Ash said she really loved prison movies. And this is one of the first prison movies I ever saw when I was a kid. Um, I know she's on a hiatus right now, so Ash, if you're listening, this one's for you. I really have bad luck on dedicating these commissions. I did one back in December for Big D because he loves documentaries. This is Spinal Tap, and he was out on that podcast. This is my luck. Anyway, Big D, you owe me a, a score on that. Um, I hope you enjoyed the movie. Um, my son and I watched it a couple weeks ago, and I thought it held up. Um, I'm giving it two solid wipes. Two solid wipes for Bad Boys 1983. The OG Bad Boys. Anyway, y'all take care. If you're ever in H-Town, let's get together and have a beer. Take care, y'all. So Scott is not only a kind and dedicated uh, listener and commissioner, but he hangs out on Discord and is one of like my closer friends on Discord in the chat Discord. Uh, and so he did a uh, an activity challenge with us uh, last month. He's currently sort of dabbling in a, a, a hard 30 with me, which is like no alcohol. You got to do workout every day. You got to get your sleep, got to get your water, journal and all that stuff. But he's taking breaks from it for tailgating. So I'm not sure <laughs> that Scott's doing it his own way, but uh, you know, it's been really cool to kind of keep in touch with him, get him to know him a little bit better. One, I would not think that's what his voice sounded like. And two, this is the last movie I would have expected Scott to pick. So I'm really excited to do it now. How do you think, was this a hard sell for his son? He, he had to have lied to him and said, hey, do you want to watch Bad Boys? And he was thinking, <laughs> hell yeah, let's watch that. That's a great one. There, this is not something you'd be like, hey, let's sit down, dad. Let's watch a good, feel-good action film. Honestly, if I was Scott's kid, I'd do whatever you recommended. This guy can, he, he shotguns beers every Friday. He's just a good fucking time. So I'm all on board for this one. Yeah. Bad Boys is a 1983 American coming-of-age crime drama set in a juvenile detention center starring Sean Penn, Isai Morales, 
Clancy Brown and Alan Ruck. Ali Sheedy appears in her film debut. It was directed by Rick Rosenthal with a music score composed by Bill Conti. The film garnered generally positive reviews with Rotten Tomatoes currently reporting a 90% fresh rating based on 20 reviews. I'm always excited about a highly rated film that not a lot of people know about. I think this fits the bill. Big D, I know you have a history with this film. Tell me about it. So there's two movies that shaped my life that I wanted to go on the on the correct path and not be incarcerated. Uh, I wanted to avoid prison at all costs. One of them was Bad Boys because it was about kids being incarcerated. I could see what it would be like to be a kid. I vividly remembered what it was like, the fights, the way to stay alive, just the very bloody end. And the other was Midnight Express. Anybody out there who was alive in the 70s, it came out in 78. It's a story of, if I remember correctly, it's an American tourist in Turkey. Uh, I think he was in college, and he smuggles a little bit of heroin. He gets caught getting on a plane. The police say they're going to let him go if he cooperates. He, again, blows up, tries to escape, gets caught, does hard time in a Turkish prison, Gene. It is, it's a lot of rape. It's violence. It's, it's an actual, it, it's a horror show, scarier than anything Hollywood's put out in a while. And this film, a pillowcase filled with cans or a a perfectly placed coat hook through a Turkish rapist prison guard's head. These are the two things, Gene, that kept me clean for a majority of my life. Well, Big D, I don't have quite that history. I was only three years old when uh, this Bad Boys was released. So the only Bad Boys I've ever known starred, you know, Will Smith and Martin Lawrence. But when this movie was commissioned, I saw Sean Penn, Prison, I thought this is going to be some melodramatic shat. You know, whenever they say it's, oh, it's this guy's breakthrough performance, but they're younger in that role. It tends to be a lot of teary speeches. And we got a little bit of that here, but it was definitely different than what I expected. So in honor of Scott and Bill Conti, let's get to the trailer. Once little boys grew up to be reliable and hardworking, but now in their world, respect has to be earned and kept by a lethal combination of money and violence. Bad boys. Meet Michael O'Brien. I don't want you to die. Nothing's gonna happen to me. He loves JC and the excitement of being somebody that matters. We're gonna be in and out of there so fast. Like that. Bad boys. This is a juvenile facility. That means you are not in charge of the zoo. We are. Come on, let's go. Bad boys. So, how do you like it so far? Do your time clean and you walk. Any trouble? And you could grow old in here, Jack. There's only one person left who believes Mick O'Brien can make it. Mick O'Brien. Life has pushed him into a corner. And he's coming out fighting. Bad boys. In a detention center, time stands still. But O'Brien won't stand for the arrival of a sworn enemy. You know, depending on who's going to kill who... Moreno's the odds-on favorite. He's gonna kill you. That's what he says. Oh, well, let me tell you something, Maricon, you're already dead. Bad Boys. A story of the survival of the fittest. Every day is a duel of strength against weakness. Bad Boys. Mick O'Brien is a teenage hoodlum who aspires to bigger things. During an attempt to rip off his Puerto Rican rival, Paco Moreno, Mick's best friend Carl is fatally shot and Mick accidentally runs over and kills Paco's eight-year-old brother. Mick is sent to Rainford Juvenile Correctional Facility, where most of the supervisors there have lowered themselves to the role of zookeepers. One exception is Ramon Herrera, a former gang member who talks tough to the inmates but holds out hope for some of them. So, Big D, every few years of doing this podcast, we develop some tiny sense that borders on legitimate film critique. We are not film experts. Neither of us has a degree in film or has ever made film, as far as I know. I think I've noticed a new one this week, a little 
a little nugget of wisdom that I've gotten from doing this movie podcast for so many years. When I hear a quality musical score in a film, I note it. Mm -hmm. And after reviewing Victory on this podcast and The Karate Kid and Masters of the Universe and Blood In, Blood Out, I knew something about the sound of this bad boy's musical score was familiar as the movie opens up. I looked it up. It's Bill fucking Conti. And what a wise investment they made in hiring this guy. The movie opens with this black and white childhood photograph montage and in it it felt years ahead of its time i had to actually check and make sure i was right watching the right one because this does not feel like the opening of a 1983 movie gorgeously crafted score i think bill conti earns his pay and if i'm ever in the position where i'm making a movie one of the first things i'm doing is finding a person who can make a quality score and I like the way you say that, that you notice that you don't note it. I always complain about scores and soundtracks that are over the top that beat you over the head. This score, you hear it and it invokes an emotion. It invokes a mood. It's not right in your face and you don't notice it. You almost absorb it. And it's part of this mood that they're building in the beginning. And we're seeing Chicago. Chicago is one of the Shat the podcast movies. This is this is one of the cities that we do all the time. If I can go back there and think of like uh, uh, probably a dozen films, we did Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, Home Alone, Adventures in Babysitting, The Fugitive, Backdraft, Dutch, Great Outdoors, Blues Brothers, of course. It's all like the Michael Hughes stuff, Uncle Buck, mm. Risky Business. And this is, to me, a non-Chicagoan. This is the dirtiest the down, the New York in like the 70s representation of Chicago. This is not Ferris Bueller's Day Off. This is not fun in the city. There's no Abe Froman, the Sausage King. It is a different tone. It's desperate. The white kids, the Latin kids, the black kids, they're out on the street and the future looks bleak. I expected these kids to be living in destitute poverty. Like the reason they're pulling off these heists and dealing drugs is because they are just fucking broke. This isn't so bad. Mick and Paco both live in large apartments. They got their own rooms. Their moms are there taking care of them. They got nice clothes. Mick has an electric guitar. He's got a hot girlfriend who looks like she does live in a John Hughes movie. Paco's dad's still around. He doesn't have a job and he's across the street, but he's around. Like, what's so bad for these kids? I wanted some more justification as to why they're being such fuckers. Well, I mean, Ali Sheedy, she got to work in, in Walgreens. She got to take the train home at night. She can't be doing that well. At least not one burning barrel in the street. That's when you know it's real bad. Yeah, <laughs> well, Mick, real bad. Mick's cellmate is Barry Horowitz, a brainy Jewish kid. Right. What? Yeah, Judgment Night. I didn't even think of it. Judgment Night. I didn't even think of it. <laughs> Mick's cellmate is Barry Horowitz, a brainy Jewish kid who firebombed a bowling alley. Their cell block is dominated by Viking Lofgren, played by Clancy Brown, and Warren Tweedy Jerome who take an immediate dislike to Mick. After witnessing Tweedy kill another inmate who tried to stab Tweedy as revenge for raping him, Mick refuses to be intimidated. When Tweedy and Viking go to Mick's cell to confront him, Mick beats them up with a pillowcase full of unopened soda cans, making him the new barn boss. Tweedy is released soon afterward and killed during a liquor store robbery. So one of the hard things on this podcast is when we're viewing it now as adults, and you think back to watching it as a kid, you always associate with different characters and different plots within the movie. So watching this now, I'm associating more with the adults, whereas back then I was thinking how terrifying it would be to be in prison, to fear getting raped. But now as an adult, I'm sitting back and I'm appreciating the adult counselors. Yes, the system's broken. It's not working very well, but there are a few people trying to make a difference. O'Brien and the other kids, when they're trying to teach them to read and they're trying to give them better perspectives and a better life, I'm immediately siding with them and I'm feeling bad for these guys who are dedicating their life to these kids who have a sad future. That without them and without having some kind of perspective and experience with age, these kids are going to go nowhere. And this time through, I focused on it from a lens of the sad situation that these kids of poverty, regardless, Gene, he's got a nice radio and a guitar and mom's hooking up with it looks like Thurman Munson from the Yankees, that, that <laughs> there is still some desperateness in this that I'm thankful that some adults still care. 
if you haven't seen this movie, Big D makes it sound like th- like this is like a like a, like a Jody Foster coming to take care of them, or like you know, so, you know Tom Cruise taking care of Dustin Hoffman. These guys, I think they spend more time like lifting weights than they do looking out for these kids. They are somehow unable to keep track of and protect like a hundred kids, all of whom you can see at the same time. It's not that big a dormitory. If you haven't seen the movie, there's like this cage with like a, a platform. And then they look down and they can see every cell and they can see the main dormitory floor. They are constantly leaving kids to start shit with one another. They see them fucking with each other in the cafeteria. They don't stick up for the kid. And then the barn boss. So the barn boss is like their helper. He's like the inmate that helps them out. And in turn, he gets special you know, favors and time off of his sentence. They just make the barn boss the most violent kid. What could possibly go wrong there? How do they not notice that Viking and Tweety, who are head and shoulders above every other kid in there, they are sadistic rapists that start 90% of the shit, but they're like, yeah, you two should be the barn boss. That sounds great. Yeah, they're doing, they're running a real tight ship there, Big D. I thought for the first couple minutes that Tweety was a staff member. So he's a full-blown adult in there with the kids. It looks like two guys broke in from the set of the Warriors and they just walked straight into the cell block. Well, Clancy Brown, we've seen before. That's Kerrigan. That's from Highlander. Yeah, which, by the way, that was three years after he made this movie. <laughs> he's like 23 years old in this movie. He's a full Why is he a adult. I don't know. And, and Yeah, he's got to be the barn boss. Those guys should be. But, Gene, you got to do what you got to do. You got to run the zoo. It, it can't all be, you know, kid gloves and and hugs and rainbows they could at least make it a little less dangerous i was shocked that this place doesn't have like three deaths a day over at rainford juvenile correctional facility which it it possibly might actually because a kid gets thrown off the fucking railing cracks his head and dies there's no police investigation they don't stop things they don't put anybody like in solitary for any length of time so maybe kids are just dying all the time the showers if i open my own prison someday big jeans correctional facility right There won't even be showers. You shower in your own fucking room. That is consistently the place in every prison movie where shit goes down. These showers, they're never supervised. You never see any of the supervisors in there. They're just isolated. They're waiting for something to go wrong. Miraculously, nothing really does. The kids get to play baseball. Baseball is a dangerous Mm -hmm. sport in the civilian world. They got bats and fucking hard balls. They get access to shovels when they're working agricultures. They let them use table saws. There's soda machines, plasticware, corrosive chemicals you can get your hands on. If you want to kill another inmate in this place, it is not that hard. And then you got to imagine that there's tons of accidental deaths that they're racking up just from the, the presence of all these dangerous things. No, it's not hard at all. They, they give the kids every dangerous possible thing. You mentioned only a couple of them, Gene, the baseball bats. There is wood shop, but they let them like have access to shards of wood. That are shaped like knives. It's almost like you're giving them a template to do it. Then they put them out into the yard to break concrete where they can have ready access to rebar, rusty pieces of steel that they could take with them. The layout of this facility, you can completely eliminate police access to it with one wood bench. (laughs) You just take the bench and you stick it against the wall and nobody can get in there. This is like a country club. They have doors. You can't really lock them a soda machine. There's access. And the director, Jeannie, this this character, I forget what the hell his name is. When he's going to do an investigation, he comes in there like Sherlock Holmes with his pipe. And he's sitting there with all the kids in individual cubes being like, are you going to tell us the truth? And he's smoking. No wonder nobody says anything. Rule number one, Gene, in this facility, no smoking. This dude is smoking, and every kid is smoking out in the open. Everybody's smoking. Yeah, you don't have to be a fucking detective. You don't have to be Sherlock Holmes in the situation to figure out what happened. You walk in, there's a child who has been hoisted, thrown 30 feet over the railing, and died. You look up. And there's two guys that look big enough to throw a kid over. They're the only two guys there that could do that. And one of the guys is zipping up his pants. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I don't have to be Columbo to, to crack the case. Uh, hey, what's that all over his face? It's semen. Oh, my goodness. What else is going on here? You look up. There's the adult man, Tweety, and you know what's going on. I prefer to give pleasure, not pain. Problem solved. Okay, so Gene, we've reviewed multiple films with prison. We got Shawshank, which actually has 
Viking Clancy Brown as the main guard. Still the barn boss. Yes, yeah, still the barn boss. You know, get him some ice cold beers, give him to the guys, do your taxes. A little different plot there, but they're very different films and they tackle prison different. But this is like kids. So I had to ask myself watching this as a kid, let's say I'm going in there at 18, I'm incarcerated, I'm a juvenile, I'm not as developed as I am now, however developed that is, I I have to think, how could I handle it? I don't know that I could. This movie does a good job, I think, of, of, of highlighting the challenges of the correctional system. Whether you said this is a great facility or not, I don't think they had a lot of funding, but I doubt that I could have handled this as a kid. I think I would have died. How do you think you would have dealt in this situation? I would have been absolutely screwed. All the ingredients of a person who could survive effectively in prison are not present in me. One, I was a hyper-violent kid, so very quick to temper. I did not have any cool at all, and I was constantly getting in fights. Now, granted, they weren't in fights with people with shivs, pillowcases full of canned soda. Couple that with the fact that I had this like uncompromising view of justice. I was a very binary kid. And so to me, right was right and wrong was wrong. And those things needed to be reinforced with violence. And so in this sort of a situation, you have to be sort of morally malleable. And at the same time, you have to be able to keep your cool. Those are two things I think you have to do to survive this sort of environment. I don't have either of those. So I probably would have gotten my ass kicked really quickly, probably killed. I'd give myself maybe a week, probably less than that. No, I think you're selling yourself short. I think you would definitely shiv somebody. You would do what it took. I think if you're violent at least once, you can get the respect enough to not be raped. I don't think I could make it in general population. I would like to do solitary confinement. Yeah, I'd be 100% great with solitary. So when Viking gets that option, four weeks in solitary or four months to my sentence, I'm taking solitary. That's a break. I can sleep. I'm safe. Hell yeah. There's no, I mean, other than people screaming. That would be like, that would be great. No, I mean, f- I lived in Lima, Ohio, dude. It was like years of solitary confinement. It was, it was fantastic. Get a lot of reading done. I think they'll let you have books in there, right? It has Get to. Get your own toilet. It's like a pink room. That's nice. I would have no problem sleeping. Yeah. No problem. I would sleep 15 hours a day. Sleep and jack off. Do push-ups. Or push-ups. That's another option. <laughs> Sarah Connor. I would fucking get jacked. Yeah, that would be That'd be a great vacation. I'm just imagining the social experiment where they put us each in a cell. Like, let's see what Big D's doing. Oh, he's so fit. He's doing push-ups. Let's see what Jesus. Oh, Jesus Christ, Gene. What? What? To avenge his brother's death. You don't have to put me in a cell. To avenge his brother's death, Paco rapes Mick's girlfriend, JC. Mick finds out and escapes prison with Horowitz. While running through the woods, Horowitz falls on some barbed wire and is captured while Mick gets away. Ramon anticipates Mick will go to JC's house and soon picks him up there. Before returning to Rainford, Ramon takes Mick to visit a maximum security prison to show him where he could end up if he continues down the same path. So, Big D, we've talked about the horrors of incarceration that this movie expertly depicts. We've talked a lot about sort of the performances that we've seen in the film I want to talk about the maturity with which Bad Boys pr- approaches relationships. This was something I was not expecting. Mick and JC have this relationship. JC is played by Ali Sheedy. This feels very real. This feels very much like a high school relationship. It, it brought back a lot of memories for me. In a movie made today, or most movies made in general, we start out with Mick and he's going to school, and then he meets the girl and he kind of likes her and they hit it off. Then You know, things are going well, and then he ends up getting arrested. In this case, they just start off as boyfriend and girlfriend, and they love each other the way teens do. They have sex on the floor the way teens do. And if you don't know what that's about, guys, it's great. And when Mick gets put away for killing a child, she defends him against her father's warnings because that's what teens do. Like, that's what a teen girl would do for her boyfriend. What really blew me away, though, the part that impressed me the most was how Sean Penn and Ali Sheedy handled the fallout from the rape. Ali Sheedy is just brilliant in the police lineup scene. I mean, she is acting her ass off in this movie. And then when Mick escapes prison and sees JC for the first time, the door opens, there's this moment where he's looking at her and she's all beat to shit. And you think, oh no, is he going to be disgusted by her, by the way she looks? Or which you see this a lot with rape survivors, their partner realizes that they can never see them as anything other than a sexual assault 
victim, right? They look at him as a victim, not a survivor. Mm-hmm. He doesn't do any of that. They just embrace and they show that their love is unshakable. And it's a really fucking beautiful scene that just came out of nowhere in this movie. You see, it's hard for me because I've I've never really respected Sean Penn as an actor. Fair. I mean, granted, he's won two Academy Awards. He won for Milk and he won for uh, Best Actor in Mystic River. As an adult, he's diverse. And yes, I know young, he went from Taps to Spicoli in Fast yeah. Times at Ridgemont High. Then he did this. But I always felt his acting style was just quiet. He never vocalized any feelings. He just sat there and you were almost forced to imagine what's going through his head. And people said, wow, what a method actor. He's very deep. And I I start to maybe appreciate him later on in his career. But here, I wasn't sure that this was brilliant, Gene, the way they're portraying this. Because Mick, he says, I want to cry. And he walks off when he finds out she's raped. And I think it's either bad delivery or it's an indication that he is like having some kind of psychotic episode because he does not emote anything that responds as genuine. And I was watching this with Vanessa and one of her friends this weekend. They laughed out loud at that face Ali Sheedy did. The, <gasps> they took it as like she was trying to be sexual or she was trying to make like a, a reconnection there. I don't know that I bought it was that great of a scene. The statement of he wants to cry, I mean, I read that thing as a perfect delivery because he's never been asked how he feels inside. It's a it's a foreign concept to him, and he's not in a safe environment, and it, that is as much of a breakthrough as you're going to get with this kid. The most he's processing in his brain is at a very, very basic level. Okay, how do I feel? How do I feel? I want to cry. But he's not going to be like, I want to cry. Like, that would be bullshit. That's where I would say this movie sucks. Okay, I'll take that back. Because I did right before we recorded. I went back and watched the ending again. He does cry there. Yeah, and I thought he was laughing. No, I know. I I, <laughs> I, I I think he was crying. I I think. At first, I was like, is he is he like, hey, hey, hey I'm out of oh, here. Like, I've beaten them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've played the it. system. Or like, uh, I just missed the PK and. The U.S. is now out of the World Cup. No, I think you're. I think you might be right. I think that was where he finally is able to release. You're, you're like a caged animal in this facility. Yeah, you have to turn off all emotion. It becomes kill or be killed, and we have to discuss the main events of this bucket of it, of the movie. Is where we get Paco's going to get some revenge. He's been stalking her. He's been waiting for her after work. And when you describe the rape in this scene and the stalking that leads up to it. She's leaving Walgreens. She gets on the train. She goes to the platform. There's a sense that she's being followed. She doesn't know. She's scared. She's alone. She's in Burn Barrel, Chicago. It's a scary city. And it ultimately ends up where she's being chased down under the tracks. We see the terror on her face. And for her, this to be her first film, she is killing it. Her face portrays all of the terror. It ends up with her being raped. And the camera does something neat. You said we're not a podcast that's actually going to break down the film, but I noticed what they did. Instead of showing the violence on her from above, like we're seeing it from Paco's view, the camera goes down and we're seeing it from her perspective. We're seeing the tracks. We're seeing the lights flicker. We're hearing the noises. We're hearing him panting over her. And it is frightening. It pulls up when it's done. It's very much we're there. We're put in the situation that we're being raped. Someone's on top of it. It's a very personal crime. And I think it justifies the emotional turn here where we're wanting to get vengeance. We're feeling violated. And it's a neat trick. They they told us so much without showing us almost anything. In leading up to watching this movie, I saw so many reviews, blog posts about it that talked about how intense it was or how the script was so violent and the things that were happening were, were you know so shocking. And I thought, okay, that's for 1983 for that time but you know now it's 2023 we've seen it all but no you're absolutely right this was a very tense very uncomfortable very frightening scene it leaves you feeling shaken and that lineup scene you mentioned we've always seen behind the mirror to make a young girl face these adult men four feet away the bravery it took and i half expected her multiple times even though i've seen the movie and kind of knew where it was going to go that she would back down that she would say, I can't do this, or she would remain quiet. The courage it took for that, and she portrayed every ounce of that fear, anger, loathing, disgrace, disgust. 
for this to be your first step out into a major motion picture, I think she's killing it. Paco is arrested and winds up in the same dormitory as Mick. Great plan. Paco attempts to provoke Mick into a fight, but Mick is more interested in early release if he stays out of trouble. In an attempt to retaliate on Mick's behalf, Horowitz plants a bomb in the cell that Paco and Viking share. The charge explodes prematurely and only injures Viking. Horowitz is condemned to solitary confinement for the remainder of his sentence, a fate he fears more than any other. Who is planning transportation in the system? Is this Tango and Cash? You read this block and we know what's going to go wrong, Gene. No, I mean, everybody at the prison knows what's going to go wrong. And here's what I don't get. They're out there assigning solitary for any fucking <laughs> reason. Why don't you go, hey, uh, so Paco's here. We're going to put him in solitary until we can send him somewhere else. Problem fucking solved. It's only going to be a couple weeks. Yeah. You put him in there. Fuck him. He's a ra- and And Ramon has been to JC's house. He's seen her. He's met her. And now he sees her rapist. That's all the more reason. To- and then he's a dick to him. Put him in fucking solitary. <laughs> Fuck this kid. I'm almost starting to wonder, Gene, if these guards are not as helpful as I thought they were. Maybe they're, <laughs> hey, thank they're, you. they're manipulating a game. Maybe there was some kind of betting going on up there where they're trying to pick who's going to kill who first. They're getting bored, poking the animals in there. You're doing everything to antagonize these kids. Everything. That's in the director's cut where you got Peretti meeting with the guards and taking bets. <laughs> He's like, okay, listen, I'm going to go pick him up at the house. We're not going to move him to another institution. No, see if you can get Paco sent here. This would be great. Let's let's have them cross each other in the hallway. Can we do this? All right, guys, let's make it happen. Okay, listen, uh, four o'clock on Thursday. Make sure nobody's in the showers. Uh, let them have- <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's gonna be can we get Viking involved? Let's get Viking in there too. Let's get him oh, oh yeah. Make them cellmates so they have time to talk with each other. Yeah, they, they could bond. This will be perfect. This will be uh, great. Perfect. And but at this point now, he's in a no-win situation. The prison dynamic, it is established that you either become a bitch. Or you become, what do they call him here? Fuck, what is he? The, the bitch master. Yeah, you either become the barn boss, you become a bitch. And Mick, he's been the man. He beat down the two biggest guys there. He's now the big shit. You bring in Paco, and Mick faces a no-win situation. He's already gone on the tour of the adult penitentiary. He knows what's coming. He's got six months left. He's got nothing he can do. I don't know how that adult penitentiary was any sort of a scared straight situation. It looked nicer. It looked lovely. Than where he lives now. I was like, oh, it doesn't look too bad. Yes. He looked like he was in a dungeon. He looked like where Bane sticks Batman after he breaks his back. That was well lit. It was multi-tiered. I bet you they had a killer law library, some entertainment systems. That did look nice, Gene. But the second... That Viking gets together now with Paco, and they humiliate him for the first time. Spits on the floor. There is no way this can come to a peaceful resolution. Once there's blood in the water, their sharks are going to circle. Do you know where it's going to go? There is no peaceful resolution that could come. Transfer him. Transfer him now. Lock him up. Do something. Maybe put a guard on the floor. At nighttime, don't just say, hey, good night, fellas, and shut off the lights. Darkness has come. <laughs> yes. I feel like Mick is partly responsible for the situation too, though, because we're introducing a false decision here where he's got to choose between violence and, and nonviolence. Uh, maybe if Mick weren't such a dick to everybody except Horowitz, yeah. he'd have allies in the dormitory that would be willing to wipe out Paco and Viking. Get some lieutenants, get some guys on your side. As soon as Mick started pushing Peretti, who, by the way, looks like a giant Michael Imperioli. It's really weird. Uh, for like a bigger cut of the cigarette trade. I was like, dude, what are you doing? You need protection and allies, dummy. People are out to get you. You want everybody on your side. So you come in, you say, hey, that old guy, those old guys were fuckers. Yeah. I'm on your side. I will actually take less of a cut. We're homies. You bring me your problems. I'll take care of them. And now you've got a squad. Instead, he's all by himself out there. You got to admit, everybody's kind of hoping he'll die. Oh, I don't blame him. That's why they're entirely the buck, 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 making noises. He's got to make friends. He's got to make allies because Horowitz isn't going to going to do it for you. Once he says, I got six months left, I'm going to do my time peacefully. Eh. He's going to he's he's everyone's bitch. He's the barn bitch. Meanwhile, you got Horowitz who doesn't give a fuck. Like, he will fuck with anybody any day. And this kid's got a bloodlust. I think he's got 
probably the highest kill count of any of the inmates, uh, you know, in Dormitory C. This scene with the boom box, I think it really introduces a sense of fun in the movie. And fun? Yeah. It's not funny, okay. per se. I'm, I'm waiting. I'm here. It plays with the audience a few times. Like when Carl and Mick are getting ready for their stick up, right? Cameron from Ferris Bueller's Day Off, Alan Ruck. It's kind of funny looking at the gun. Their ski masks look ridiculous. It's having a little fun. But the most fun to me was waiting for that boom box to explode in Viking's face. He's like jamming out. He takes it outside. He shows it to all the people. Hey, look at this sweet boom box. He's doing twirls and he puts it up to his head and takes it away from his head. Then he puts it up to his head. He puts it right up to his face then back to his ear. And the whole time you're like, any second, <laughs> this motherfucker is going to blow up any second. I think, I think Clancy Brown did a great job pulling off this scene. I thought it was, again, not funny, but fun. I'm I'm having a hard time g- getting getting on board with you here. It was it was tense for me. I I, I don't oh, really. I I didn't think it was fun. I was he's a bad guy. You know that, right? I was wanting him to get maimed. I was I was looking for him to get maimed. But you didn't feel the movie playing with you at that moment, dangling it out there and then taking it away. Then they're giving us reasons to hate these people. They're giving us reasons to become animals like the inmates. They're giving us reason to to like things that we normally would. So maybe in a normal situation, we'd be like, oh, this is terrible. That little kid just maimed another <laughs> child. But at the, by this point in the movie, we're, we're enjoying the suffering. Him laying on the ground with shards of plastic yeah, and metal great. in his face. So maybe you're right. Maybe it is done in a way that we're losing some of our humanity and we're becoming animals like all of these kids. And we're like, we're the ones shaking the fence, being like, yeah. Gene, if we were, if we were cellmates. Yeah. You and I would be out there raising hell and causing chaos and maybe getting raped. Shit, we would definitely buy into it. You have no other choice. I just like Clancy Brown dancing around with the radio. Paco accidentally learns he is being transferred to another facility and decides to kill Mick that night. He fakes a ruptured appendix, Ah. knocks Ramon unconscious, and locks him in the office. Paco then goes to Mick's cell, but Mick gets the jump on Paco. The other inmates barricade the door to the dormitory, and eventually Mick gets on top of Paco and prepares to deliver a fatal stab. He resists at the last second and stabs the floor mat instead. Mick drags a beaten Paco to the supervisors and heads back to his cell, crying in remorse. This is too convenient. You happen to walk by the exact guard who is saying, oh, by the way, that transfer for Paco tomorrow, it is coming through. He's like the one guy, his cigarette connection, who's going to go back and tell him. This is like human cockfighting. They got to be putting these kids against each other. Once again, also Ramon then has the opportunity to go, oh, we're transferring out tomorrow. We should put him in solitary for a day. For the night. So he doesn't do anything crazy for an hour. Let's do it. But we're getting here to the point of the movie that everybody knows. I I wrote on Twitter. I said, hey, poster, way to spoil the end of the movie. (laughs) The poster is the actual final battle. What the movie has led up to. What has Mick learned? The entire movie has led us to this one moment where now circumstances are perfect. The inept guards are stuck in their cage by that magical wood bench. All of the kids are out. They're shaking the fence. They're screaming. And you're watching it. You're coming to the end. And you've appreciated the effort along the way. You're wondering, what is O'Brien going to do? All these little lessons he's had. Is he going to go? Is he going to make the decision to stay incarcerated for the rest of his life? Is he going to get out? And he finally gets on top of Paco. And again, this, this prolonged battle, he's got the ice pick and he comes down and he stabs it and all the kids are screaming, kill, kill, kill. And they're shaking the fence. It's like animals in a cage. And he drives it down to a thud. We don't know. Is it in the middle of Paco's head? Did he stab him in the chest? It's silent. Everyone looks stunned. The guards gasp. And we're left wondering the core question. Did rehabilitation, did it fix him? Is there a chance that he could get better? Did he reoffend? Every indication points to Paco's death. It's silence. But surprise, Mick didn't do that. Mick chose to end the cycle of violence. It's in the ground next to his head. He walks off. And I'm thankful that there was a bit of an optimistic ending to the film because it was bleak. It was super depressing. You couldn't have this movie end with Paco's head split open like, prince oberon like the red viper on the ground there 
You couldn't do that. It would have been less impactful. It would have been depressing. At least this, there's some hope. What happens here? Does he get out in a few months still? Or does he get tossed like into solitary? Because on one hand, he didn't kill the kid. But on the other hand, like you, sh- you show up there and you got these guys fighting and one of them is like sitting over the other one with a f- fucking knife. It's not good behavior. Well, in the real world, Mick broke out of fucking juvie. Right. He broke out. He got Horowitz caught up in the in the barbed wire, who was obviously yeah. hurt. He gets all the way home. You let him back in, knowing the way this institution is run. Right. They make them roommates. Because now Vikings' heads exploded, so he's out of there. <laughs> Horowitz is gone. If we know anything about the facility, they're going to bunk them together. That's the next move. That's the next movie. Yeah, it's Bad Boys 2, Bunk Mates for Life. That's what this movie becomes. They get Michael Winslow right next door just to make sound effects. <laughs> Sounds like our jail cell open. Let's make a break for it. <laughs> Big D, you mentioned how long this fight is. For those of you who have never tried to take a knife away from a person who wants to kill you, it's really tough to do. If you haven't either disarmed that person or successfully run the hell away from them within seconds, I'm talking like one, two, maybe, that's it you're probably going to be in really bad shape. Like there is no holding a knife while a person is trying to stab you. They're going to get you. They're going to get you real fucking good. And I understand it's a movie and they needed a prolonged action sequence to raise that suspense, Big D, and bring up all those questions, give everybody time to bring the bench out and all the kids time to gather around in a theatrical fashion and make the film interesting. But it was frustrating to watch, man. I was getting really itchy and annoyed. I wanted to like coach Mick through the whole altercation and help Paco understand that he could just circle his arm at any point and just stab the guy. Was that irritating to you or did you just go, yeah, it's kids. That's how kids fight. I'm sad to say, because it's a very dark, depressing movie that makes you think about a lot of things. I did find myself humming the West Side Story theme, like the (laughs) battle of the, because it's almost as if they're dancing on top of the picnic tables. And they're going back and forth. And in a movie that's really gritty, that's really like minimalistic in the violence and the way they show it, this seemed a bit excessive. This seemed to be, let's drag this out for dramatic effect. And there's one poor kid on the cell block who's like giving like good advice that nobody's listening to. He's like, get his eyes, get his eyes. (laughs) You remember also in uh, Three O'Clock High when the principal's like, don't fuck this up, Mitchell. (laughs) Don't fuck this up, Mitchell. (laughs) That's what the guard's doing. That one guard is in the tower looking at him like, hey, what are you doing? And I thought it was a bit excessive. Yeah. But yeah, I guess you needed to build up to that ending. Whatever. I'm not going to fault it for it because it was impactful. When he walks away now and he finally does laugh slash cry and we're left to wonder again what happens to his future. Theoretically, he should still be. He should have gotten another probably two years for escaping. Now this will be attempted murder. And also they're going to probably pin the guards getting trapped and the destruction of property. And he's probably an accomplice in Horowitz's bombing. Most likely, he will spend the rest of his life in jail, but at least he made this one right choice. All right, Big D, now's the time we give our Shat score for the 1983 Bad Boys. Shat score is our way of telling you how many wipes this movie takes to get off your respective butts. Zero Wipes is a perfect movie. It is making love on the floor of your girlfriend's house so nobody can hear you. And Five Wipes is an absolute disaster. Just find that sweet boombox in your cell only to get your eardrum blown out. Big D, we'll start with you. What is your wipe score for Bad Boys? I have to compare this to some of the other films we've done, some other like prison films. My favorite is Blood In, Blood Out. I thought that was a great sweeping tale. I mean, that was a three-hour Mexican godfather. That was a great film that portrayed every angle of incarceration. They developed the characters leading up to it. Here, I think they shorted the beginning a bit. I thought it got a little excessive in the final battle. It's good. The message is good. The performances of the young actors are good. But as a whole... I don't think it's as good as it could have been. Shaving off 15, 20 minutes uh, would have done a lot for the film and also letting us know maybe the ending and the future of some of the characters. But I think it's a 1.75 wipe. I I think it's better than average, uh, but it is not as good as the 0.75 masterpiece for me, Blood In, Blood Out. Yeah, oddly enough, I had to use Blood In, Blood Out as kind of a reference point as well for this movie. Um, I got to say that the individual performances uh, were pretty damn good, uh, particularly Sean Penn, Ali Sheedy, really, really um, enjoyed their performances. Even Clancy Brown was was doing some work here. Uh, at the same time, though, it's not as 
polished. There was some melodramatic moments to it, like mm-hmm. you said, sort of a West Side Story sort of element uh, to the movie. It's good in its own right. It's a movie that I would recommend if people wanted to you know, ask me, is it worth watching? I think it certainly is. At the same time, I, I think that I've seen better. And really, it's in that range of like a Rambo first blood to me. So I'm going to go just slightly less than that, two and a half wipes for bad boys. And with two and a half wipes for me, one and three quarter wipes from you, that gives us an average wipe score of 2.125 wipes for 1983's bad boys. So June, with a wipe score of 2.125 wipes, that now sets this alone, surprisingly, 145 spot. It is slightly better than Home Alone, Major League, Under Siege, The Sandlot, and slightly worse than Event Horizon, The Devil's Advocate, Color of Money, Kids, and Crimson Tide. I think we're going to get some mail about that, but I think it might all come from people who've never seen 1983's Bad Boys. It's not bad, boys. Oh, I think a lot of people, have, I think very few people have seen it. Yeah. I brought it up to to some friends and some listeners, and everyone always assumes the other one. They don't even know this exists. And Scott, if it, if it helps at all, this is a movie I'm glad I watched. It was a discovery that I made as part of the pod. And it makes me wonder, was Ali Sheedy pigeonholed into that Breakfast Club war game short circuit? Could she have done something more high art, something more dramatic, a Jodie Foster? Was that in her? I don't know. She's a babe, though. This film says that there, there was something more there. All right. Well, thanks, Scott, for the commission. Uh, Big D, if we have time, I'd love to do a voicemail. Okay. First one comes from Mike, and it's about a film that you are, are hopefully looking forward to commissioning for your birthday with Nell and I. Ooh. Hello, Shat Crew. This is Mike Trulock from California. I just listened to your Alan Quartermain podcast, the first one, and uh, the British guy at the end talking about with Nail and I. Guys, I want to commission it. I'm going to. I'm going to do it tonight when I get home. Please don't take that opportunity away from me. I want to do it for my 50th birthday and for whatever Gene's birthday may be that he wanted it for. 44. It can be a dual thing, man. We have a commonality of experience. I lived yes. in England during the height of Britpot from 97 to 99. Yes. <laughs> uh, man, um, love your guys' take on all the movies. I've finally caught up almost completely. with. I've started about a year and a half ago, and you guys are spot on with my love of the movies and the genres that you guys dig and everything. I don't agree 100%. Roger had some wacky ideas. I love Ash's take on just about everything. Hope she comes back. Hope everything's well with her. And love you guys in general. Uh, don't want this to ramble on too long, but please, I want to commission with Neil and I. I've uh, spoken with the wife about it. I've got the go-ahead. I'm going to do it tonight when I get home. <laughs> uh, you guys rock. All right. Um, yeah, I, I, might, uh, I might call back and leave another one of these. All right. Love to everyone. Bye. Mike, I'm, I'm not just saying this. You sound fucking amazing. First of all, uh, we were in England at the same time, which is wacky. Uh, in 99, if you hadn't left by the time I got there, uh, it was the summer of 99. But that shared life experience, shared love for this movie, uh, just and just the joy that you have and possessiveness, I might add, uh, about with Neil and I, uh, it really makes me feel good somewhere deep down inside. I'll be turning 44 uh, next May, so... With, for your 50th and my 44th, I'd, I'd love to do this. And speaking of 50th birthdays. Oh, yeah. Sir. Sir. Yeah. Are you excited? I am. I'm, this, I think this podcast comes out on my birthday. I will be on a virgin cruise uh, with a group of friends going to the Dominican Republic and uh, probably embarrassing myself for yes for a, another time. Looking forward to it. It'll be exciting. Uh, it'll be nice to go on a cruise and, and not be 380 pounds. So I'm looking forward to that. So it'll be fun. My only request, Big D. Yeah. Is don't get sunburned. No, we I'm got wedding photos. Yeah, yeah. No, don't worry. I am actually a very, uh, since I've been on my weight loss journey, I'm more uh, aware of, of skin and I'm uh-huh. trying to take care of my skin to keep it supple, yeah. as elastic mm-hmm. as possible. I do not want to get sunburned. I try to wear, like when we went on our on our uh, airboat <laughs> excursion in New Orleans. You look like you were on the cast of Dune. Yeah. I specifically bought a long sleeve shirt from the location. I, I put a, a towel over my head. I try to limit uh, the damaging sun rays as much as possible. SPF 50 to 100. It's a must. So I will not show up being burned and ruin your wedding photos like Uncle Buck. 
I appreciate that. Really appreciate that. And thank you, Mike, so much uh, for your voicemail. Yeah, Mike also came through, just so you know. Oh, cool. He's already come through. He's done. Mike's a man of his word. Thanks, Mike's wife. Happy birthday, Mike. And next up, we have a voicemail from Reg about Tango and Cash. Hey, guys. Love the show. Um, You had a call from uh, an English fella saying that um, the uh, actor Brian James was... uh, uh, had the worst um, English accent that he'd ever heard. Uh, and then you said the actor was Australian. Um, no, that was a different Brian James. Oh, Jesus. The actor in Tango and Cash, Brian James, was actually American. So, yeah, just letting you know if you were a bit confused there. Uh, yeah. All right. Cheers, mate. See you, mate. Well, this breaks our triangle. Our triangle rule of accents. This is this is terrible. This is almost as embarrassing as uh, my Brian May uh, mix up. But I, I appreciate you sending us straight, uh, Reg. Americans, we do our best. Yeah, but you, also Brian James. There's a lot of Brian James. That's like a John Smith. There's we got some English guitarists. Yeah, that's a good thing for Gene Lyons to note. Not Google Brian James and go, oh, he's Australian. Wow. Yeah. Well, we'll forgive you for that, Gene. You're you're usually spot on. So we'll, we'll, we'll give you a pass on that. Yeah. Gene, next week, we're going on a much further adventure. We're going back in time. We're going back to Vietnam in 1970. Captain Willard takes a perilous and incredibly hallucinogenic journey upriver to find and terminate Colonel Kurtz, a once promising officer who has reportedly gone completely mad. In the company of a naval patrol boat filled with street smart kids, a surfing obsessed air cavalry officer and a crazy freelance photographer, William travels further and further into the heart of darkness, commissioned by April R. Uh, this came out on my birthday in 1979. Woo. Francis Ford Coppola. This is a giant film, multi-award winner. This is this is cinema, Gene, and I'm excited to go back there. And just to understand the depth of our dedication on this podcast, April, uh, I have purchased the Redux version of the movie on DVD and we'll be watching the entire thing. I've done that once before in my life. I was much younger then. Uh, And so we'll see now uh, as an adult if I can make it through. It is grueling, but uh, I'm I'm looking forward to it. So am I. Thank you, April, for the upcoming commission. Thank you, Scott, for commissioning Bad Boys. Thank you to all the commissioners who make this podcast possible. That concludes this week's episode of Shat the Movies. Be sure to follow us on social media and share with a friend. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, and Instagram at Shat the Movies. You can email us, host at shatpod.com. Support the podcast by shopping our Amazon affiliate link, buying our merch, or by commissioning your own movie. Find all that information by visiting our website, shatpod.com. Also, check out our sister podcast, Shat on TV. Review TV series such as Lovecraft Country, Westworld, True Detective, Taboo, American Gods, Game of Thrones, and Watchmen. Find all information on our website, shatpod.com slash TV, wherever a fine podcasts be found, including Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, and YouTube. Be sure to subscribe, and if you stop by Apple Podcasts, please leave a five-star review. It helps the podcast grow. On behalf of my co-host, Big D, I'm Gene Lyons. Join us next week for the following movie. I've been a soldier since I was 19, and I still haven't learned how to wait for it. I wanted a mission for my sins. They gave me one. Nobody had ever gone on a mission like it before. And when it was over, I'd never want another one. Your mission is to proceed up the Nung River in a Navy patrol boat. Pick up Colonel Kurtz's path at New Mung Ba. When you find the colonel, infiltrate his team by whatever means available and terminate the colonel's command. Terminate. Terminate with extreme prejudice. My orders say I'm not supposed to know where I'm taking this boat, so I don't. But one look at you, and I know it's going to be hot. Baby, right where you want it. This is the first of the night. Air calf, son. We're coming low out of the rising sun. And about a mile out, we'll put on the music. It scares the hell out of the slopes. My boys love it. Smell of napalm in the morning. Smells like victory.
Disneyland. I'm short and we gotta go up there so you can kill one of our own guys. You look bad, I said I think you bad, huh? They're all dead, stupid. Who's the commanding officer here? I hear you. Ain't you? He was close. He was real close. I couldn't see him, but I could feel him. These are all his children, man, as far as you can see. They think you've come to, uh, to take him away, and I hope that isn't true. Could we, uh, talk to Colonel Kurtz? You don't talk to the Colonel a lot. Well, will you listen to him? Are you an assassin? I'm a soldier. You're an errand boy. Sent by grocery clerks. Collect the bill.